Uh, hi, I'm uh, uh, Bradley Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lissa, and on behalf of the entire staff, I'd like to welcome you here. Uh, we're very fortunate to have with us this evening uh, Ira Katz-Nelson, who holds an endowed chair at Columbia University in political science and history. Professor Kat Nelson is an accomplished social scientist, an influential and prolific author. He's written extensively about American political and social history, as well as about comparative politics and political theory. Not quite sure what poli comparative politics is, uh, but we can maybe talk about that later. Uh, in his latest book, Fear Itself, The New Deal and the Origins of Our Time, Professor Kat Nelson tackles one of the most formative periods in U.S. history. In fact, he asserts, as you can tell from the subtitle, that this was the determinative uh, period in the past century. Now, you may be asking, as I did when I picked up his book, why another book about the New Deal? Well, Professor Kat Nelson, and by the time I'm finished, I won't be able to say that name right off the tip of my tongue here. Professor Kat Nelson actually addresses this question, why another book? Uh, at the start of his very ambitious and provocative work, arguing persuasively, I think, that enough time has passed to warrant a, a fresh look. Uh, he has great respect for such monumental previous studies of the period as Arthur Schlesinger Jr.'s three-volume effort, The Age of Roosevelt. But he offers some new, insight, some new insights that do indeed provide a richer and more complex appreciation of both the Roosevelt and Truman years. Now, I say the uh, Roosevelt and Truman years because, to start with, Professor Katz Nelson defines the New Deal period as not just the 1930s, but the 1940s uh, and into uh, the uh, early 1950s as well. What this encompasses is not only the Great Depression era experiment in economic recovery and the enlargement of government responsibility, but also America's challenge in confronting totalitarian regimes abroad, the, the Nazis and the Soviets. I'm sure Professor Katz Nelson will talk more about this expansive definition of the New Deal in a minute, but coursing through these uh, two decades uh, that he covers uh, were some powerful and, and prevailing currents of fear, uh, fear of poverty, fear of totalitarianism, fear of nuclear warfare. And one of the great strengths of this book is its sweeping portrayal of how representative democracy was evolved to manage these threats especially how the U.S. system confronted the dictatorships abroad of fascism and communism. Another great strength of the book is its shift in focus from the presidency to, to the Congress and its penetrating discussion of the compromises made with the pivotal uh, bloc of Southern Democrats. Getting the South to go along with New Deal initiatives involved ducking race and other issues related to the deep-seated culture of white supremacy. Professor Katz Nelson poignantly makes the case that the New Deal's triumph in reshaping democracy to survive the dangers of the time must be tempered by the sorrow of an accommodation then with racial humiliation and a structure of lawful exclusion. There's a critical lesson to be learned here in, as he puts it, the inescapability of moral ambiguity. And one last note uh, before I turn the micropho microphone over to him. Uh, I don't want you to be put off by the, uh, the thickness of this book. Um, it's about 500 pages of, of text, uh, but its writing is elegant and very accessible, and it will, guarantee, uh, it will carry you along. Now, Professor Katz Nelson plans to speak for a little while, and then he'll take questions. Uh, we ask that if you have a question, please try to make it to uh, either that microphone or that microphone uh, because we are recording and videoing the talk so that we can uh, post it uh, online and make it available to, uh, to others. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, Professor Katz Nelson will be happy to stay and uh, sign copies of his book, which are for sale towards the front of the store. So if you haven't already, please turn off your uh, cell phones and join me in welcoming Ira Katz Nelson. Well, 
I, I thought I should stay there and <laughs> let uh, Bradford Graham um, continue. That was a, a wonderful and gracious and substantive uh, introduction. It's a, it's a great treat to be here. Uh, I don't mean just here in D.C. I mean at politics and prose. This is one of the great intellectual centers um, in the Northeast, at least, of the United States, and in some sense, the whole of the United States. And I've just been introduced by a person um, who uh, cares a lot about intellectual uh, life and loves books and has ensured that this bookshop um, has a durable future. Thank you. Um, well, you mentioned um, Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., and it, it actually turns out to be the case that um, an essay he wrote shortly before his death, um, in he, uh, that is his death in February 2007, a, a piece that appeared in the New York Review of Books, um, motivated much of my thinking about how to structure and consider the New Deal. Schlesinger wrote the following. Conceptions of the past are far from stable. They are perennially revised by the urgencies of the present. When new urgencies arise in our own times and lives, the historian's spotlight shifts, probing now into the shadows, throwing into sharp relief things that were always there, but that earlier historians had excised from collective memory. New voices ring out of the historical darkness and demand attention. Let me share with you some of the new voices that I heard when I started doing research. And I recouped some notes that I took. Um, I, as I was telling Brad before, I nearly didn't get out of primary school because of my handwriting. So these are notes taken some years ago, um, six years ago. And um, I'm, if I have trouble reading them, you will understand. But these are some voices that rang out. Walter Lippmann, Walter Lippmann, um, the, the, the leading journalist of the country in the, certainly in the 1930s. 1939, three times in these 20 years, the American people have had great hope, and three times they have been greatly disappointed. 1939, he was referring to um, post-World War I, um, the hope that democracy would triumph globally, but it manifestly had not by the late 1930s. Second, the hope of the 1920s that the market economy, that capitalism would produce persistent prosperity, clearly had not happened with the crash of 1929. And the third disappointment, said Lippmann, was Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Um, that's one voice crying out of the wilderness, as it were. And I'll come back to Lippmann. Here's a second. This is Senator James Eastland of Mississippi on the floor of the United States Senate, January 31st, 1944, in the midst of a debate about how soldiers, we had more than 11, 12 million soldiers under arms um, by January 1944, how, if at all, they should vote in the 1944 presidential election. And um, Franklin Roosevelt had proposed that as soldiers could not get an absentee ballot in the field, they, each soldier should get a, a, a federal ballot and could write down the name of the Dewey or Roosevelt and they preferred for president. But the bill that passed was not the Roosevelt bill, it was the Eastland bill, the Eastland bill and the Rankin bill, both of Mississippi. These boys, said James Eastland, this is a precise quote, are fighting to maintain the rights of the states. These boys are fighting to maintain white supremacy. Third, let's see if I can read this. Uh, E.B. White, it's the, I, I uh, cite E.B. White at the very front of the book, the great writer E.B. White, letter to the New York Herald Tribune, November 29th, 1947, not 1933, uh, 1947, I live in an age of fear. And last, Dwight Eisenhower, at his inauguration in January 1953, science seems ready to confer upon humankind as its final gift the power to erase human life from this planet. Now, one way or another, these are all voices of fear. 
um, voices at least of deep anxiety. And yet, the dominant history writing, the historiography of the American New Deal typically says, and I'm of course simplifying, um, Franklin Roosevelt came to power under conditions of fear. He told us we had nothing to fear but fear itself, and very quickly he conquered fear. And that's how the, uh, the three volumes, uh, the trilogy of uh, Schlesinger ends um, by saying by 1936, fear had been conquered and the faith of the American people had been restored. And of course, in part, that's true. But in part, it's not true, as these voices of uh, Lippmann and Eastland uh, and White and Eisenhower signify. So I tried to think about fear and fear itself and try to think about it in part because we live uh, in an age of fear and because the relationship of democracy to fear um, continues to be a fundamental challenge to us as American citizens. To be sure, our current age probably has not produced anxieties of the same magnitude of the 1930s and 40s in issues of economic volatility or military insecurity, but I believe we're being tested in similar ways. So I decided I would like to try to explore how the New Deal dealt with fear, and a New Deal, as the introduction said, that extended from, in, in, at least in the imagination of this book, from 1933, March 4th, when Roosevelt was inaugurated, to January 1953, when Dwight Eisenhower was inaugurated as president a 20-year run of Democratic presidents, and 18 of those 20 years, um, those Democratic presidents had Democratic Congress. Now, to examine fear, I, um, the book makes, uh, offers four shifts in perspective. And um, you've already heard a, a very good summary of some of them. The first is the extension in time through the Truman administration. Why do that? I think there are three reasons. The first is fairly simple, maybe even simple-minded. Um, Harry Truman was Franklin Roosevelt's last vice president. Um, Harry Truman became president only because Franklin Roosevelt died in April 1945. Um, and it's artificial uh, to cut off this period of democratic rule at the point when Roosevelt um, uh, tragically died in Warm Springs. Um, but that's not a good enough reason. By taking the period through to the early 1950s, we can um, see and we're challenged by um, sets of phenomena that demand explanation. First of these is fear, and the second is a new American state that was fashioned in this city um, by the end of that period, but not before the end of that period. First, let me say a word about fear. Fear is not the same as ordinary risk. Um, all life is full of risks. Um, we buy a home. Uh, we take a chance. We, we believe it's going to go up in value. Until recently, we believed homes always went up in, in value. Um, we marry. 50% um, of marriages uh, don't last. Um, but in the case of buying a house and in the case of getting married, we believe that we can assess the probabilities. The, the risk is knowable, but there are circumstances that are so unsettling, so shocking, so productive of deep anxiety that they generate fear. What kind of circumstances? The utter collapse of market capitalism um, that led to 25 percent unemployment um, by the late 20s and early 1930s. In that era, 25% unemployment meant more than it would today because the great majority of women were not in the wage labor force, which meant that almost or perhaps 50% of Americans had to sustain themselves without a wage earner. There were no precedents for that. There was no way to assess the probabilities. or And there certainly were no policy, status quo policies that could simply guide remedies. And simultaneous to the collapse of capitalism, 
was the rise of mass dictatorships of a new kind. Most dramatically, uh, in Nazi Germany, Hitler, after all, became chancellor just weeks before, Eisen uh, before Eisenhower, before Roosevelt was inaugurated. Hitler, on January 31st, 1933, became chancellor of Germany. But also the fascist government of Rome and the Stalinist government in, uh, in Moscow um, claimed to be better democracies than the Western liberal democracies because they represented the people directly without the barriers that come through political representation and parliaments, the messiness of procedures. The German state represented the folk, the German race. The Italian state represented the nation. The Soviet state represented the working class directly in an unmediated way led by political parties that brooked no opposition and that claimed to be the authentic voice of the people. And that produced fear, fear in the democracies that the democracies could not solve big problems the way those dictatorships could. Fear that the challenge of the dictatorships would be um, a challenge lost by the democracies. But there was a further layering of fear in the, in the period of the 30s and 40s. Not just the collapse of capitalism, not just the competition of new kinds of mass and often popular dictatorships, but also unprecedented violence. The Second World War put civilians at risk far more than the First World War had, certainly in, in Europe and in Asia. The Second World War was fought at a level of um, passion and violence um, that had not been known in human history, culminating, of course, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, with weapons that no one could have dreamt about um, before. And of course, at the end of the war, there was the discovery of the genocide of the Holocaust, followed by the Cold War and by 1949, a circumstance in which the adversary of the United States also possessed atomic weapons. As a primary school uh, boy in Brooklyn during the Korean War, I had to do duck and cover exercises under my desk and wore a dog tag to school, um, lest there be an attack, as, it, as if had there been a nuclear attack, that dog tag could have identified me. But, the, um, but that's a, I remember viscerally uh, being afraid. Um, so by extending the period through the Truman years, we have an empirical history of a layering of sources of fear, each one unprecedented, each one a circumstance in which it was impossible to assess risk the way you would in buying a home or getting married. Further, fear is not just a context, but fear can be a motivation for action. Um, and I tried to understand fear both as context and as motivation and felt I couldn't do that unless I treated that full period. But further, by extending the period, it's possible to discern an objective analysis, something we need to explain, which is quite profound, I think. It's not my discovery, of, uh, profound, but almost anyone who's looked at the late 40s and early 50s uh, some of us, f friends here with whom I have uh, known a long time, um, uh, read the same books I read in in, in, as an undergraduate in graduate school, um, David Truman on interest groups, 1951. By, by the early 1950s, we had developed in Washington a national state that had two sides to it, uh, two faces, like the Roman god Janus. On one side was a domestic state that by the early 1950s was an interest group state in the sense that government had grown enormously under Roosevelt and Truman. And as government had grown, there also grew up um, tens, even hundreds, of competitive interest groups who fought for the largesse of that new big state. And that state, described by the political scientist David Truman in 1951 was one that was very thick with procedures but very thin on a sense of a collective public interest. 
The public interest was what the competition of the democratic game produced. On that reasoning today, the public interest is Obamacare, is the Affordable uh, Health Care Act, because it passed. If two years from now a new Congress would repeal Obamacare, in that imagination that would become the public interest. So there's no a priori interest in one or another way of treating health care. It's a provisional story, a, a story of democratic competition amongst competing ideologies and interests. The other side of the national state that was fashioned by the end of the Truman years, let's call it a national security state, was the complete inverse of the domestic state. It was very strong on public interest against the dictatorships, against Nazism, against fascism, against Stalinism, for democracy. Galvanized the country for that interest. But it was a national state with almost no procedural constraints. Um, by 1949, we had a central intelligence agency that did not have to report its budget to Congress. By 1949, we had all the institutions we now know, the Joint Chiefs, the National Security Council, um, the, then the Atomic Energy Commission, all of which, uh, as well as uh, institutions of surveillance and secrecy at home, this was a powerful national security state in which the, the rules of the game were at best under-specified. Um, executive power was uh, primary. Well, we still live with this dual state. We live in this town with this dual state. We live in this country with this dual state. So by extending the period to the end of the Truman years, we can see what I've called in the subtitle the origins of our time. The second, and I'll go more quickly, the, 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 the second key shift in emphasis the book makes is to situate the New Deal in global context. And I've already um, discussed the issue of the dictatorships. But what's worth noting is that key figures, um, not just in Rome, Moscow, and Berlin, but in Washington, um, thought in the early 1930s that the United States could not compete with the dictatorships unless adjustments were made to our constitutional form of governance. Listen to Walter Lippmann. Lippmann again. This is Walter Lippmann the month before Franklin Roosevelt was inaugurated in a series of columns in the New York Herald Tribune, a great lamented newspaper. Walter Lippmann wrote, um, the United States, the situation he wrote, requires strong medicine. He advocated, quote, extraordinary powers to the incoming president. The danger we have to fear is not that Congress will give Roosevelt too much power, but it will deny him the power he needs. The danger is not that we shall lose our liberty, but that we shall not be able to act with speed and comprehensiveness. He urged that extraordinary authority be given the president, quote, for a period, say, of a year, the widest and fullest powers under the most liberal interpretation of the Constitution. And I'm quoting, concurrently, he said, Congress should suspend temporarily the rule of both houses to limit the right of amendment and debate, to put the majority under the decisions of the party caucus. And this supersession of normal politics, he concluded, is the necessary thing to do. If the American nation desires action and results, this is the way to get them. Third shift, away from the president toward and the executive branch to Congress. Why Congress? Because it was Congress, as Lippmann just said, that was thought to be the problem. Um, we couldn't solve big problems if we had a complicated procedural legislature. Um, it's hard to pass a bill um, in the United States. How could we confront the emergency if Congress could maintain its character? But we did maintain Congress, and we did solve big problems in the 30s and 40s. Um, and we did so through the legislature. And therefore, I wanted to understand how that happened and what its terms were. But it's worth noting that Franklin Roosevelt, in the forgotten part of his inaugural address at the end, flirted 
with Lippmann's proposals. This is now Franklin Roosevelt. It may be that an unprecedented demand and need for undelayed action may call for a temporary departure from the normal balance of public procedure. Should Congress not act promptly, he warned, I'm quoting, I shall not evade the clear course of duty that will confront me. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis, broad executive power, to wage a war against the emergency as great as the power that would be given to me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. Now the great thing about the New Deal, to me the greatest achievement of the New Deal, is that never happened. The dictatorship's vortex of violence and brutality was not only met, but trumped by a model of constitutionalism and law. Congress kept and asserted its legislative prerogatives. And we can talk later, if you like, about the 100 days where Congress came very close to not um, exercising its prerogatives. But even in the 100 days, key features of uh, legislation were inserted that the President didn't want. Um, in the national, just one example, in the National Industrial Recovery Act, this great law that uh, controlled the American economy until the Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional in 1935, Franklin Roosevelt had not wanted, had not wanted public works to be included as too expensive. And it was only at the insistence of Congress that we got a large public works program as part of the NRA. The fourth and last shift in the book arguably the, the, the largest in, in, in a way, is to look inside Congress in some detail and inside the Democratic Party, which was, of course, the agent of lawmaking in this period. The great agency of lawmaking was the great majority uh, Democratic Party, especially huge majorities in the 1930s, some smaller majorities after 1942, and for one Congress, the one elected in 1946, uh, the Democrats were in a minority. Um, inside Congress, we see something quite extraordinary. Um, the shorthand word or term that I use in the book is a southern cage. There were 17 states in the Union then, not 11 that seceded in the Confederacy, 17 states that mandated racial segregation. That is, under the law, it was not possible for any village or hamlet to allow a black child and a white child to attend the same school. Um, that included Delaware, as well as um, Missouri and Oklahoma and Maryland, um, as well as the Deep South. Those 17 states elected 34 United States Senators. Um, 1940, just to take a year, they were all Democrats. 34 Democrats in a Senate of 96 seats. Nothing could pass over their opposition. Nothing. House of Representatives. The South had disproportionate majorities for one very obvious reason. They had more seats than they had, vastly more seats than they had voters. Um, we, give, we give seats uh, in Congress by population of a state. But the rules in the Jim Crow South um, kept almost all black people from voting. 4% of African Americans could vote in 1940 in the South. And the rules that kept blacks from voting, like the poll tax, kept many whites from voting. In the state of Mississippi, in 1938, there were seven candidates for Congress, population 2.3 million, and 43,000 votes were cast. Um, that's an extreme case, to be sure, but it's, uh, I think, exemplary of the system. And because it was also a one-party state, not one of those congressmen in Mississippi had a Republican opponent, um, members of the South, from the South, were much more likely to gain seniority, to become leaders, as great people did, like Sam Rayburn and Lyndon Johnson. Um, uh, Johnson later, of course. Um, and the, um, the South dominated the legislative process. Indeed, after 1938, Southern members of Congress were a majority of all Democrats in Congress. In the 1930s, nothing could pass into law against the wishes of the Southerners. And by the middle, late 1940s, everything that passed into law was authored by key Southerners.
um, uh, or at least deeply endorsed by key, key Southerners. In that, the strongest way to put it, but it's too strong, would be the South, ironically, the Jim Crow South, made the New Deal, the Congressional New Deal. And that um, had consequences. Some of them, one might say, were very positive, and some of them quite negative. Um, just let me end by giving two or three quick examples, and then um, I'd love to hear discussion and uh, questions. Labor policy. 1935, the Wagner Act passes, the National Labor Relations Act. Without the Wagner Act, the CIO would never have developed as swiftly as it did um, in the late 1930s. A mass, industrial, prog largely progressive labor movement. A labor movement that also tried to organize in the South under various headings, including one called Operation Dixie in the 1940s. The southern wing of the party voted for the Wagner Act, but it only voted for the Wagner Act once farm workers and maids were taken out of its can of protection. The same was true of Social Security. Farm workers and maids were not eligible for Social Security until the 1950s. The same was true of minimum wage and maximum hours. It applied to everyone, but not farm workers and maids. Why? Because that's what black people did in the South. Um, if you were a man and lived in the South and you were African-American, you were very likely to work the land. And if you were a, 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 an African-American woman you were, and in the wage labor force, you were very likely to be a maid in a white person's household. Um, that was the deal of the 30s. But by the 1940s, that wasn't good enough for the southern wing of the party because they were incredibly fearful about labor organizing, especially in the South. By the end of the Second War, roughly 20 percent of the private wage labor force in the South was in unions. Today we have 6, 7 percent in the whole country. The 1947, it already began in the war, Taft-Hartley Act passes. Um, and the Taft-Hartley Act, which sharply restricted um, the rights of labor, was um, proposed by two Republicans, Taft and Hartley, um, vetoed by Harry Truman, so it takes two, more than two-thirds. Uh, and how does it pass into law? The Northern Democrats vote to sustain the veto. The Republicans vote against the president, but the Southerners now vote for Taft-Hartley. And when they saw the word labor by 1947, they also saw the word race. Um, because for them, the issue had shifted from a pure labor to a race. And in consequence, a polity in which labor and business and the government, corporatist style, so European corporatist style, might bargain with each other, which was something, among others, Walter Ruther uh, clearly desired, was no longer possible because labor could no longer become a national class, an organized national class. And instead, we got the tens and hundreds of diverse interest groups that converged on a competitive politics in Washington. Another example, um, conscription. This I'll, I'll put in the positive side. You know, if you look at the, at the political sociology of fascism, uh, you can observe that in the 1930s, um, uh, the strongest supporters of fascist parties, including the Nazi party, um, came in Europe from, uh, quote, backward rural regions um, where um, uh, people had many resentments about the Depression and about their economic circumstances, a lot like the American South. The Democratic Party kept the American South inside the game of democratic politics. That's a plus, but at a big price, some of uh, the cost I've already mentioned. But on one issue, um, it turned out they actually rescued the United States. July, and I'll end with this example, July uh, 1941. The prior year, President Roosevelt had proposed and got from Congress authorization for the country's first peacetime draft. We'd never have a, had a peacetime draft before. Um, but it was hedged with restrictions. It would only be for one year. Soldiers would be drafted for one year, and they could not leave the Western Hemisphere. 
So isolationists who did not want to get involved in the European war could vote for it. It was to protect the homeland. It wasn't to go to war against Germany or in Asia. Um, a year later, 1941, Roosevelt look, <laughs> looked around and the wor world had gotten a bit more dangerous. The Soviet Union had been uh, uh, attacked by uh, Nazi Germany uh, by the summer of 1941. And Roosevelt says we have to extend the peacetime draft. Republican Party, Republicans almost to a person voted no. Why? They said, A, we don't want to go to war. Second, um, we're at peace and in peace. Um, to force people to join the military is a violation of liberty and we are a party of freedom. That was the principal argument. Many Northern Democrats voted no. Why? They had Irish, German, and Italian constituents. Um, Britain was not particularly popular in Ireland. Um, uh, and uh, many people, for wholly understandable reasons, did not want their sons drafted to fight their cousins um, uh, I I in Europe. The northern wing of the Democratic Party was divided. Only a nearly unanimous southern vote for conscription gave us a military months before Pearl Harbor. And that vote was 203 to 202 in the House of Representatives. So just a shift. It's not a, not a tough counterfactual. You know, historians worry. Can you really reason against the fact, you know, counterfactually? Well, I think we could imagine one or two people changing their vote. Um, and had they done so, the United States at Pearl Harbor would have had a military smaller than Belgium's. Um, and just think about how long it would have taken to train up an armed force uh, once the Second World War had begun. So the Southern story is complicated, but it's been largely neglected um, because most New Deal histories acknowledge that Franklin Roosevelt <laughs> never endorsed civil rights because he was afraid of losing Southern votes for his programs. That's conventional wisdom. But I think it's important to get inside the story of Congress and understand the nature of lawmaking in that period. And so doing, we can understand the nature of modern America because the, the state, the, the national government that was created by the late 1940s, early 1950s, in large part, not exclusively, through the agency of the southern wing of the Democratic Party, is the world we continue to inhabit, both its strengths, its weaknesses, its advantages, and its pathologies. So let me close by just reading the last two paragraphs of the introduction. If history plays tricks, Southern congressional power in the last era of Jim Crow was a big one. The ability of the New Deal to confront the era's most heinous dictatorships by reshaping liberal democracy required accommodating the most violent and illiberal part of the political system, keeping the South inside the game of democracy. While it would be folly to argue that members of the Southern Wing of the Democratic Party alone determined the choices the New Deal made, their relative cohesion and their assessment of policy choices through the filter of an anxious protection of white supremacy often proved decisive. The triumph, in short, cannot be severed from the sorrow. Liberal democracy prospered as a result of an accommodation with racial humiliation and its system of lawful exclusion and principled terror. Each constituted the other like the united double nature of both soul and body in Goethe's Faust. This combination confers a larger message, a lesson that concerns the persistence of emergency, the inescapability of moral ambiguity, and perhaps the inevitability of a politics of discomforting allies. It also reminds us that not just whether, but how we find our way truly matters. Thank you very much. We're open for questions and comments at the microphone. You know, I'm uh, 78, so I remember many of the periods you're talking about. And one thing I think is the more things change, the l how little they changed. 
I cannot remember a period of my life in which fear of one thing or another is not common. Uh, when you mentioned the idea that people want to shift to a different form of government to achieve things, I think, for example, of the high-speed train idea, which China has been building all over, and people complain that we should change our system so that we, too, can build high-speed trains. But a more specific example, I think, of your last comments about the influence of Southerners is the Davis-Bacon Act. You don't seem to have mentioned it. It's not in the index, at least, of your book. No, I just had time to glance there. But uh, so I said, say a word about Davis-Bacon, just a, a word. What? Say a word about Davis-Bacon. Uh, well, the Davis-Bacon Act was enacted by the influence of Southerners in the late 30s because they did not want blacks to be employed. The reason is, if you have to pay prevailing wages, they felt confident that white contractors Wouldn't would not hire, hire blacks because they couldn't hire for lower than the white workers, so they might as well hire whites. That was the purpose behind Davis-Bacon, and I think explicitly stated to be so by the people who proposed it. It's still let, in existence. Let me, if I may, um, interrupt you and give an example. Um, another example, um, uh, Hill Burton Act. This is Hill Burton Act 1946, this is later, which built hospitals across this country, a very progressive piece of legislation. Um, uh, it's also not in the book, so I'm just, uh, the, the um, Hill, Hill Burton, uh, America didn't build hospitals um, in the 1930s because of the Depression. We didn't have the money. And then we didn't build the hospitals in the early 1940s because we were at war and all the resources went to war. So our medical facilities were woefully neglected. Congress in 1946 passed a law to have federal money go to the states to build hospitals. Adam Clayton Powell, Jr., a new African-American congressman from Harlem, proposed an amendment. Um, that that money should be spent um, uh, without uh, discrimination on the basis of race, religion, national creed, national origin, and so on. And um, uh, the Southerners basically went to the Democratic rest of the Democratic Party and said, you passed that amendment, we're voting no on the hospital bill. You want the bill, you can't have no discrimination. Um, the bill passed without the amendment, and in consequence, federal money was used in the late 1940s all over the country, but especially in the South, to build hospitals, many of which were segregated, um, uh, hospitals that had rules in which black doctors were not allowed to touch white patients, um, and in which even within hospitals you had separate black and white um, floors. And that's what in a prior book I called uh, When Affirmative Action Was, was White. Yes? Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate your very uh, vivid portrait of the uh, power of the southern wing of the Democratic Party, uh, which obviously dominated uh, legislation during the period you're talking about. My question is as follows. To what extent was there a kind of Faustian bargain going on in terms of passing the legislation of the New Deal uh, in return for not moving on social issues regarding segregation? In other words, we all know about the legislation that you talked about associated with the New Deal, but was there a countervailing force pushing for uh, the rights of the African Americans, in, particularly in the South, or was that, or not? So that was there a, you know, a quid pro quo? Did Roosevelt, in particular, did he consciously make a Faustian bargain, or not? I mean, that's great question. So. I think there were three periods across this 20-year history with respect to issues of race and, and, and the national polity. Um, until the mid to late 1930s, the issue, issues of race were basically off the agenda. Neither party, neither the Republicans nor the Democrats, even Northern Democrats, wished really to touch um, the issue. With one modest exception, there was a proposal in 1935 um, written by Senator Wagner of New York to have federal law uh, about lynching um, and to punish a lynching if the states did not. Um, but everyone understood in 1935 this was a wholly symbolic act. Um, uh, it had no chance of, of passage um, and uh, was symbolically useful for everybody. That is, Republicans could claim to be against lynching and for civil rights. Northern Democrats could do the same, especially in the House where it did pass. Um, and then everyone knew the Southerners could show that they were protecting the autonomy of the South in matters of race. So everybody had a symbolic victory, no bill passed. 
Um, and it was in that climate of almost absolute security or a feeling of security that the white South had that Washington would not conduct civil rights campaigns that the early phase of the New Deal unfolded. So it was less an explicit Faustian bargain, as it were, than an implicit one, because everyone knew that there was zero prospect um, that there would be uh, efforts made in employment, in uh, physical security, let alone segregation. And I should add that for the whole period, not one Southern member of Congress, including some liberal heroes, like a, a hero of mine, Claude Pepper of Florida, not one ever um, opposed a segregation publicly. Some were in favor of black voting rights, some were in favor of uh, equal employment um, provisions, but none ever opposed segregation. But by the mid, by the late 30s, with the rise of organized labor, um, Southerners became much more anxious about the future of questions of race. And then during and after the war, the issue of civil rights was on the agenda. And it was at that point that the southern uh, wing of the Democratic Party uh, no longer was making a bargain with the president. They were asserting themselves against the president. And the only great example, and it is a great example of courage, uh, is when Harry Truman, by executive order, desegregated the military, but nothing through Congress. Thank you, George. Without oversimplifying it, could you say today the Republican leadership is still fighting the New Deal? <laughs> yes and no. Um, uh, I would say that uh, um, probably in, in a simple answer would be um, increasingly yes. Um, that to the extent to which we would think of um, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, for example, as not the New Deal but as um, successor programs of the New Deal, the completion of the New Deal, that is now under assault in the, the future, the longer future in the Ryan budget. Um, but not Social Security anymore. The Bush administration toyed with privatizing Social Security. Uh, they got burned. When Ronald Reagan made some proposals, there was a 99 to 1 Senate vote instantly telling him, don't touch this. So there are parts of the New Deal that are inviolable, that become part of the social minimum for all Americans. But many features are, um, are under assault, and what's primarily under assault is the sense that it's, it's the federal government's responsibility to deal with questions of human security and to create a floor um, within which or under, over which uh, Americans can pursue um, economic and social and activity. So yes, um, but there was a very long period, including the Eisenhower period, where there was c almost complete acceptance of what the New Deal uh, had accomplished. It was the Eisenhower administration that brought in those farm workers and maids to Social Security. It was the Eisenhower administration and, and then later the Nixon administration that um, uh, uh, indexed Social Security um, and made sure that um, uh, people over the age of 65 were not disproportionately poor. Today it's children who are disproportionately poor, not, not the elderly. Yes. Um, I would just I would comment that uh, Social Security is under attack. Uh, that the Republicans are very interested in raising the age of Social Security from 65 from 67 to 70, um, and clipping the benefits in various ways. My question is, would you connect the views in the South and the with the Tea Party? Um, I mean, there used to be just a, a few, you know, sort of far out Republicans who were opposed to things like Social Security and Medicare. I mean, I, I'm not from the, I'm 66. So I remember when you wouldn't think of questioning Social Security or Medicare. The, the question was when to expand it mm -hmm. and how to reach the whole population. Um, so the, the, the sort of right wing of the Republican Party has gotten much bigger and powerful. Yeah, so the um, question is, what's the role of the South in the story? Well, is there a connection? Yes. So, look, the, the single greatest change in the, the partisan politics of the United States, certainly in my lifetime, is the shift of the a center of gravity, partisan center of gravity of the American South from the Democratic to the Republican Party. Right. Didn't happen all at once. Um, uh, but. As I said, in 1940, there were 17 states practicing racial segregation. Every single one elected a Democrat to Congress. The congressional delegations, with the exception 
of a few Republicans in the Hill country of Tennessee and occasionally one in Maryland um, or one in Delaware were, were Democrats. Um, today, there still are Democrats um, from the South, and of course President Obama carried um, uh, Southern states, which itself is a kind of miraculous uh, matter. But the um, the center of gravity is Repu certainly in the White South. The center of gravity is Republican, and that transformation happened for more than one reason. But a central reason was a very self-conscious effort. Um, from within the segregationist South to try to find allies who wanted a weaker central government, um, one less likely to, quote, interfere in the South. Mm -hmm. um, and from the perspective of the Republican Party, think of the Southern strategy of President Nixon, uh, a, a, a willful attempt to change partisanship by appealing to the white South after the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act. And that largely has been a successful successful story. A footnote, academics love footnotes, in um, Mississippi, my favorites, I, I, I actually have profound affection as well as uh, angst about <laughs> Mississippi. I, um, the, uh, the state of Mississippi, it, well, in the United States as a whole, in 2008, every county, including Republican counties, voted more for um, Barack Obama than for Senator Kerry. Um, even in states like Idaho, where the white vote was sort of 32 percent for Kerry, 36 percent for Obama. And the average was over 40 percent of white votes for President, what became President Obama, Senator Obama. Except in Mississippi. In Mississippi, um, 11 percent of whites voted for Obama, and Alabama, 10 percent. So you have a, um, something of a continuous um, uh, story of the, the power of, um, of the black-white divide. Is there a, yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Well, happily, some of my questions have been answered. I have one comment first, which is I understand uh, that most federal contracts, uh, construction contracts, et cetera, bar people hiring people with a conviction or felony conviction, which in many ways, again, works against blacks um, who one could argue are disproportionately convicted for whatever reasons. Uh, my question, though, is um, you talk about Roosevelt uh, uh, calling for freedom from fear, but it seems to me in the current time and earlier times, too, I see you don't talk much about McCarthy, but. Uh, Fear has been something that's been manipulated by politicians and certainly uh, by the Bush administration with 2011 and now arguably because of all the money that was spent pursuant to that fear, we now have the Republicans pushing the fear of the deficit. Um, so do you see the uh, man the use of fear, the manipulation of fear as more common in American history than freedom from fear. More common is a very strong um, mm -hmm. statement, um, and that, that I really want to think about, not, uh, not give a glib answer. Um, the fear itself, the great thing about Roosevelt's speech was that he told us not to fear fear, even if we had a lot of things to fear. Um, was the, the opposite of demagogy. Um, that is, uh, it, it didn't mobilize and say, we have all these reasons to be fearful, and therefore, um, let's do X, Y, and Z. He said, no, um, we shouldn't be fearful. Um, but then he also did flirt with doing <laughs> X, Y, and Z. Um, uh, look, um, uh, it's not just McCarthy. The book does talk about internal security um, uh, questions. Uh, one has to say it's not just McCarthy. The very first um, violations of um, uh, even Supreme Court uh, decisions on uh, regarding surveillance and privacy were taken in 1936 when um, uh, and um, the target was American Nazis. Um, so that poses hard questions for a lot of us. Um, the uh, uh, harder questions perhaps than even than the McCarthy period. And in which um, uh, J. Edgar Hoover warned President Roosevelt, we can't do the kind of surveillance you wish us to do under the Constitution. 
um, and under the Supreme Court. And, he, and Roosevelt said, I'm going to use my powers as commander in chief to order surveillance. Um, and he called in Cordell Hall, Secretary of State, and asked him to make the request of J. Edgar Hoover for national security reasons. And once national security was invoked, uh, the president said, well, now as commander in chief, I order you um, to do this surveillance. It was President Truman who ordered a federal loyalty program in 1947 that investigated every federal employee through the FBI. And actually, I believe that McCarthyism, which was horrible, um, but the congressional um, uh, uh, form of McCarthyism um, was in many ways less insidious um, than the use of the executive branch and the Federal Bureau, um, uh, and even on occasion central intelligence, um, to go way over the constitutional line. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, some years ago, new left historians criticized the New Deal because it, it, did, it wasn't socialist enough. And I'm wondering if, if some of your interpretation, if you could clarify it, that, that the New Deal didn't tackle racism and segregation isn't an unfair uh, criticism yeah of the politics of the possible at the time and may miss the point of what it did accomplish, which is to address the economic uh, 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 challenge to the country. I wonder if you could just clarify yeah. that. Let me be very clear. I, I, I even say it explicitly in the book. I'm not writing a wagging the finger morality tale saying um, Franklin Roosevelt um, you know, uh, failed um, uh, to end racism when, as it were, he could have. Um, but what I do do is, I mean, there were things he could have done symbolically that he didn't, and some things he did do by executive uh, power, uh, like the executive order of 1941 about uh, non-discrimination in uh, war industries. So uh, there were things that could have been done that weren't done. But my main point is not that. It's to stress that the, the logic of the situation um, in which, through lawmaking, the New Deal's great accomplishments, including uh, the accomplishments that helped uh, write um, or create an answer to the collapse of capitalism, um, the New Deal's greatest accomplishments, which went through Congress, had simultaneously to go through Southern power. And that's why I use the phrase Southern cage. It was imprisoned in a cage. Um, uh, and even with the greatest will in the world, it would have been in that cage, because votes were not available absent a series of rotten compromises. So um, I don't disagree with you about that. Um, I'm not, I don't want to, uh, to create some utopian uh, counterfactual and say it didn't meet that utopian uh, standard. But I think we do need to understand how modern America was made and what price was paid as well as the great achievements of the New Deal. I have enormous affection, of course, for the achievements of the New Deal. But sometimes um, things you have the most affection for, even people you have the most affection for, uh, are people um, whose defects you might, or situations you might also see. One more. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Rhonda Williford. I'm a lawyer for the National Labor Relations Board. And during my 33 years there, I have seen the rights of employees decimated. And, um, and at the same time, I, I'm a student of workplace abuse, and, it, um, and I'd, I'm not tra quite sure of the progression of that, but the statistics show that currently uh, at least, my, and this is a conservative number, at least 30 percent of employees are subjected to workplace abuse. And this is kinds of work, mostly, largely psychological abuse that go beyond the legislation that we currently have in place, sexual harassment, uh, sexual discrimination. Um, discrimination against union activity, that, those kind of things. There is a healthy workplace movement that is trying to get legislation passed to make uh, these kinds of psychological abuses unlawful as well. But it, they're having a very hard time uh, making headway. I think they've made the most headway in Massachusetts, but still not uh, converted into law. But I, I know from my own personal experience and talking to um, uh, colleagues and other people I know that um, the, the style of management in many, in, in many um, government agencies and companies is, is management by fear. I'm talking about on the, on the, on the, micro, so on the micro level. And that this, has a, um, this has a very damning effect, not only on productivity, 
not only which of course translates into the well-being of the economy, but on the um, on the uh, quality of life of, of employees. So uh, I wonder if you, uh, I, I think the scope of your book is somewhat different from that, but I just wanted to bring up that on the micro, on the micro level, fear is very much in place and fear is very much being used by managers in many companies and government agencies. Thank you for those comments. Uh, the one very short thing I can say, which the book actually does mention, um, or points out, is that the, one of the very first uh, moves that um, one of the first times you could see Southern Democrats saying, we made arrangements with the, um, with the New Deal, but um, were we doing ourselves a favor or do we need to break with our earlier uh, views, came, uh, uh, had to do with the National Labor Relations Board. Um, uh, between 1938 and 1940, there were hearings held um, led by Cotton Ed Smith, a great segregationist Southerner of South Carolina, and um, uh, um, the the upshot was, um, uh, and the rhetoric was used, that the CIO um, uh, was a, a subversive force in American life, and that the NLRB was supporting that subversive force, and therefore it was the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, that had to be cut down in size. And critically, critically, um, Taft-Hartley um, changed the legal environment um, within which um, uh, labor relations proceeded. And I would say ever since the 1940s, um, there have been circumstances, even in democratic administrations that have had labor as something of a priority, um, probably more so in past than present um, uh, democratic administrations, um, because the numbers were different. Um, even then, it became very hard to secure um, labor workplace rights um, uh, through the Labor Relations uh, Board as effectively as had been envisioned, envisaged when the Wagner Act passed in 1935. Thank you so much. So I hope you can now see there was a need for a new book on the New Deal. Buy it up front and Professor Katz Nelson will sign it up here. Thank you all again for coming and please fold up your chairs to help our staff and put them uh, against some solid surface.